we are tonight, uh, Brooklyn for Peace Arts and Culture Committee uh, is presenting you with the arts and activism panel discussion. So in tonight's discussion, what we're hoping we can accomplish is to uh, cover these the specific these type we have specific questions for them but our whole goal is how effective can artists be as activists are they the new leaders uh, are followers chroniclers and how do artists use their creativity to participate in and mobilize the peace and justice movement so with our specific questions we hope that through our panel we might get some answers to these wonderful things now um, I'd like to begin to introduce the panel. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about them, but I'm going to have them tell you about who they are. Because artists are better at that than anything. Trust me, we just run our mouths and run our mouths. OK, so I'm going to start with the first uh, artist, a young lady, Karen Malpede. I'll take it. I'll start. Oh, there she is. Okay. <laughs> uh, as I have here, she's a writer, a playwright, a director, and co-founder of Theater 3 Collective. She most recently staged her play, Another Life, in NYC. So I'm going to have Karen tell us a little bit about herself and what she's currently doing. Hi. Uh, so I'm the co-founder of Theater 3 Collaborative with George Bartenieff, who's eating back there at the table. <laughs> Um, who's a fantastic actor. If you've never seen him act, you have to come to the, our next play. Um, we have just closed a production of Another Life, which is, I'm proud to say, the only uh, American play about the U.S. torture program uh, in, that's been written and staged. We've done three productions in New York City, and we're about to take the play to London for two performances. Uh, we're an 18-year-old social justice and social action theater that does uh, poetic language, character-driven plays on various themes, uh, important social themes. Our newest work is called Extreme Weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R, and we're doing a reading of it in September, September 10th at the Cherry Lane Theater. We're very grateful to Brooklyn for Peace for supporting our work and, and sending it out on, on your e-blasts, and, and uh, so we thank you all. It's been a great help to us. Thank you. Let's give it up. All right, uh, the next person is Megan Trevino, and she's an artist and organizer representing Arts in Bushwick. That's the organization. Arts in Bushwick is a volunteer nonprofit organization that encourages artists, residents, families, and youths to partake in Bushwick's creative community by contributing to their leadership, time, and talent to our diverse groups of organizers. Um, I probably said that like so weird and it like <laughs> makes no sense. So you're probably better at telling people what, what it is that uh, you're doing and currently. Uh, yes, yeah, so Arts in Bushwick is an all volunteer based organization um, up in Bushwick, New York and it started in 2007 um, by seven artists who are still continuously in active in it but um, it's all volunteer based whereas anyone can join and they can say they want to volunteer, you can take on as much uh, work that you want to and what I do with Arts in Bushwick is run a community team so my goal is to go out into the community make friendships and networks and try to build bridges linking all of the different communities that we have in Bushwick because you can tell you probably heard it in the newspaper that Bushwick is now the new art location it's huge it's bustling um, but with that also comes consequences such as moving out an older population, which we're trying to slow down that process. Um, yeah, and I'm also an artist as well, but mostly an organizer for other artists. Thank you. Uh, okay, and last but not least, uh, we, we have worked a lot with Spirit Child. He's always so wonderful and, and, and donating his time and energy and all these different uh, art projects that we have. So we love him. Uh, Spirit Child, rhythmic poet of mental notes, 
uh, leader of the Hip Hop Fusion Band Mental Notes, Experimental Hip Hop Fusion Band. He's founder and chair of Movement in Motion Artists and an Activist Collective. Uh, he's a creative consultant for Eyes Infinite Films, and he does a whole lot of other things, but I'm going to have him tell us those things. <laughs> Thank you, uh, and uh, thanks for being here uh, tonight. Um, appreciate that and having this discussion. Um, uh, yeah, so Movement in Motion is pretty much uh, like a heart of where I'm at, right? Um, it's about organizing through the arts and culture and creating a culture of resistance. So using hip hop, um, informed activism. So we do projects around political prisoners, um, political education, and then we write songs about it, make movies, um, and go out to the youth and have a dialogue in that way. Um, through that, I'm involved also Cop Watch, um, uh, Stop and Frisk, Stop, Stop and Frisk. Um, so we believe in doing uh, as well as like kind of theater the oppressed type style. So we'll do things and demonstrate in the streets and have people come and then we'll give them information on know your rights and what it is you can do to assert yourself and surveil and monitor police activity. Um, a lot of my focus has been the prison industrial complex um, and just overall we'll get into more things but um, capitalism is whack, right? <laughs> like, and we have many ways to express that and deal with it and that's what I'm trying to do. Excellent. Okay, so uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone if you have cell phones or iPads or television sets to turn them down or turn them off so that they're muted. We don't hear any of the extra stuff coming out when uh, the panelists are sharing some of their most profound thoughts on these things. All right. Everybody okay? Yes. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, that's what I want to hear. Okay, so let's get going. We have three specific questions for, and I think that probably uh, a really cool way to do this is if you take turns being first. Okay. Mm -hmm. But whoever's going to be first first, of course, that's up to you, so you have to decide that, that now. So I'm going to throw out the question, and we'll see where we're going. Okay, the first question. Brett? Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Famously said that art is not a mirror held up to society, but a hammer with which to shape it. Do you agree or disagree? And explain. Um, I'll go first. I don't really think art is one thing over the other. Um, like, there's no crying in baseball, there's no rules in art. So I'm, I see artwork and I see a lot of creative minds will use the arts to express themselves and get their words and their ideals and their opinions out there. But it's also, um, I do see it as a potential strong tool that we can use to help shape society and bring people together peacefully. Um, however, I wouldn't necessarily use a destructive tool such as a hammer Instead, I would use a collaborative tool uh, and use the resources that we already have. Uh, like Arts in Bushwick, we have a unique resource, which is artists. We have over hundreds, like over 600 artists at least, in the Bushwick community. And um, we use that, and with my community team, we use those artists to bring free art and accessible activities and opportunities for the entire community. Um, such as over the past year we've had free workshops for the community, they're family friendly, they're, you know, and they're free. Um, we also have a mural project that was in a collaboration with several community organizations, uh, middle school students, and even a professional Bushwick artist. Um, and then this past year we also launched our first annual community day, which bridged a whole community of community organizations and artists and performers into one central location in Bushwick. <coughs> okay. um, yeah, I think art, uh, just as mentioning the collective, I, I think it's, for me, it's, it's everything, right? Um, and, and I think the question should also extend itself to the artists um, as far as, I don't see art and revolution separate, right? Um, so if you are a painter or 
a musician, it should be revolutionary in my eyes. Um, you have a responsibility, right? So it's a very dangerous tool as well if you don't use it wisely. Um, I do a lot of work uh, in alternative to incarceration programs and the shelter system as well. And it's all through art. We communicate, we talk about Emmett Till, we talk about the Black Power Movement, the Black Liberation Movement, we talk about things happening now in Palestine, like we all do that through art. Otherwise, um, it's a dialogue. Um, and if we go there with a lesson and some books and this kind of vibration, it's not gonna resonate. Um, when we were protesting uh, the invasion of Iraq, um, several, several years ago, we would go to Harlem in a recruiting center where it was like very heavily, uh, they would get their recruits from, right? Very busy. Um, and we were on the corner of 125th and we were just doing, like I said, theater of the oppressed style. You know, we were freestyle, give them information on military myths. But we had that dialogue and we kind of, we didn't shut it down, but no one signed up to register to be a part of the military that day, right? And having that dialogue with people in the community and seeing daisy cutters and what that would look like and jelly and all this ooey gooey stuff on the floor and like kids passing by is really intense. Um, but uh, it, it's our responsibility to, to, to have a revolutionary standpoint as artists. So it could be um, kind of iffy on, on whether it is uh, because of all the mainstream uh, art that we're combating uh, and it's, it's poison as well to our communities. But revolutionary art, yes, can shape mold, build, create, and have a good dialogue, I believe. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> one thing I forgot to say about Theater 3 Collaborative, but I, which I will add in now, is that we, we run our plays with what we call festivals of conscience, so that after the performance, we always have dialogues with, um, for instance, for, the, for a, Another Life, which is the anti-torture play, we had a lot of the lawyers who are representing Gitmo detainees. Um, we had Mark Danner, who broke the Red Cross torture report. Um, we had Jocelyn Raddick and Tom Drake. Tom Drake is uh, the NSA whistleblower before Edward Snowden, and Jocelyn Raddick runs the Government Accountability Project. So we had a lot of, I would say, most of the major players in the anti-torture movement, in, in, certainly on the East Coast and sometimes uh, from further away. We had Victoria Britton from England and Michael Ratner from the Center for Constitutional Rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so our, our notion is that uh, art, and I'll speak to what I think art does in a minute, but that art opens people's hearts and minds and then we dialogue with the audience. Uh, and we found that, especially around uh, the torture program, um, people really wanted to know. We had uh, Noor Alashi, whose father, Ghassan Alashi, is serving 65 years in uh, maximum security prison in Colorado for the crime of uh, writing uh, charity checks to women and children in Gaza. Um, and we had Tarek Mahana, uh, whose brother Tamir is serving 17 years also in maximum security prison in Colorado. Uh, for the crime of not uh, refusing to collaborate with the FBI and infiltrate his mosque. Um, so the prison industrial complex and the anti-torture movement are actually one and the same, <coughs> and they should be much more connected than they are because solitary confinement, which is torture, is used in our prisons uh, routinely. Um, most of the people in prison have never been found guilty of any crime. They've copped a plea uh, <coughs> to, you know, uh, so, so the, the pr and, and so the prison industrial system, which includes uh, the Guantanamo and Bagram Air Force Base and the other black sites that are still operative, is one and the same and, and really ought to be uh, more connected. Um, but let me go back to the Brecht question for a minute, because I'm a theater <laughs> historian, so forgive me. Um, but uh, uh, Noam Chomsky pointed out, and I think it's true, he, he asks the question often, are we living in the Weimar Republic? In our version of Weimar, Brecht lived between the, the wars in Germany and then he was a, a refugee for the Second World War. Because he was a communist, he had to leave uh, Germany immediately uh, when uh, the Nazis came to power. Um, but the Weimar Republic, of course, was this, this weak democracy that tipped itself very easily into what became an elected form of fascism. And so here we are in this moment where we can ask ourselves, is this, uh, history doesn't always, never repeats itself exactly, but here we are in, again, a weak democracy 
democracy that seems, uh, with every increasing week, to be tipping a little bit more. <coughs> and, and not without resistance, one has to also say. There is, there is resistance, and the question is, how strong is our resistance going to be, and how, you know, how uh, fully based? So I don't agree or disagree with Brecht's famous comment. I, I see Brecht as a historical figure and an interesting one. Um, I really like his early plays best, uh, um, and I would recommend Ball and Jungle of the Cities and Man is Man over the later plays. Um, but I think art is, uh, the purpose of art is to strengthen our ability to hold complexity and ambiguity in our hearts and minds. And I like the idea of the thinking heart. Um, that, that art is about giving us greater capacity to feel and to think at the same time because I think that's the nexus that we're operating on. If, if we can connect the heart to the head, we will be revolutionaries. There's no, there's no other way. Mm -hmm. Nonviolent revolutionaries, I think to speak about violent revolution um, in this country is to commit suicide, um, uh, and, uh, and also that it doesn't work. So I'm uh, committed uh, to nonviolent change. Okay, <coughs> very nice. Uh, next question. This one takes you way, way back. <laughs> How did the arts influence you as a child? Were they a part of your development as a social person? Or is it because you had a favorite rock star that you thought, whoa, I want to do what they're doing? And since you started, uh, uh, do you like to start sure. with that? Sure. Okay. okay, so I, I, uh, I went to really good public schools um, in the suburbs of Chicago. And the older I get, the more grateful I am for public school education. Uh, because in the house where I grew up, we had the Reader's Digest condensed books every month that came. The, the, pop, the pop novels of the time in shortened abridged versions, and I devoured them on the living room floor. But that was about it. That was, that was, those were the books. Uh, so uh, because I went to really good public schools, I read James Joyce very early. We saw The Seventh Seal. Uh, the Bergman film, and uh, I'm just naming three experiences. And I went, was taken to see the touring production of Jean Genet's The Blacks when it hit Chicago. And those three experiences, there were others, but were uh, woke me up to the power of art and to the to the profound emotional and intellectual power of art. And unfortunately, uh, Jean Genet's plays don't tour anymore. Uh, you can still see The Seventh Seal, but Bergman is no longer alive. Um, I guess people still read James Joyce. But I think our culture, the cultural possibilities shrink, have shrunk in a, in a certain way. Um, but, but I would say that, you know, uh, being exposed to such great works of art at an impressionable age changed me, you know, forever. Um, and then the other thing is my grandmother and mother both acted in little theaters, so the theater was not a, not a radical theater, but the theater was part of our life. And my mother was cast as Amanda in Tennessee Williams' play, The Glass Menagerie, when I was 10, and so I had to help her learn her lines, so I learned all the lines to the play. And that was, that was instructive, too. So. Um, I guess for me, I've always knew that I was an artist. I knew I could draw. Um, I was also fortunate to go to really good public schools. And uh, when I was in elementary school, we had women come, like these two specific women I remember, they would come and they would teach us a new artist, and then we would go and we'd try to like replicate it in our own elementary way that we could. Um, and then I also grew up with a very creative family, so most of my family members play musical instruments. Um, so I was you know, exposed to a lot of classical music and art history and different types of artwork at a young age. And I also then realized as it was, like being an artist, it helped me gain a lot of attention from my peers. Um, I mean, they would force me to like pause our VHS tapes so I could draw our favorite Disney characters for them. Um, and then I used that attention that I was getting and I used it in high school to start organizing art community projects for my classmates, um, which clearly I still do that today. And um, like again, I was, I was very fortunate to be exposed to all these things. It's made me a very well-rounded person. I can 
do a lot of things with it. And I think um, our work for the Arts and Bushwick community team, we are working out in the community and we're hopefully, I think uh, we are creating the same impact for the youth in our communities by, you know, with these programs that we're doing, we are exposing them to team building and creative problem solving, um, confidence, leadership, and things to help them appreciate themselves and where they come from and the cultures that surround them and all through working with <coughs> artwork. So, um, yeah. Um, uh, so before I answer that question, I wanted to, um, <laughs> Tariq Mahana, we actually have some CDs there as far as like using art. Um, so we did a, a double disc project for Tariq Mahana and uh -huh. we went to Boston a lot of times um, and I write to him frequently, mm -hmm. very good brother. Um, that's another way that art has been, uh, uh, you know, we, we we're promoting his cause, COINTELPRO, whatever you want to call it now, right, um, to the younger generation through hip hop, through that auspice and through that vehicle. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned Tariq. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and just, uh, um, I don't know if y'all know Maroon Schultz, Russell Maroon Schultz. This is a really good book, and I know it's a different dialogue, but the question of violence, there's a really good essay in here on that. Um, and you guys can take a look at this. Um, I won't get too much into it, but I think it's a good, it's a, it would be a nice discussion to have at some point, the question of violence in our movement and where we are. Um, and just about thinking and prefigurative training, right? And just being prepared regardless of what you want to do with that. Um, but also art, uh, Chuck D wrote the forward for this, right? For Public en Enemy. Um, and one thing that he states is like the prison military industrial complex is a scar on Mother Earth itself. Mm -hmm. And if all artists thought that way, like we would be in a much better place right now, right? And how we teach that to our people. Um, so back to me, my where I'm, where art came through. Uh, <laughs> long, time, long, time. <laughs> long time, long time ago. Um, so uh, I'm a member of Zulu Nation as well, right? Um, and, and Zulu Nation is pretty much what I grew up around, right? The culture of hip hop. So um, in doing that, do people here know the elements of hip hop? Tell us. 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 And knowledge. There it is. All right. <laughs> knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, right? So it's one of my students over there. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <all right>. uh, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, this is what I grew up around. Um, the, the conditions, if you know hip hop, 1973, South Bronx. I'm from the South Bronx. Uh, if you know what that is to be black and brown, Latino, right? Growing up in the neighborhoods, um, not having access to equipment training or whatever the case is, making use of whatever you can make use with, right? So taking cardboard and dancing in the streets, uh, plugging in, taking power, like literally taking power, right, from the state and just plugging into the light posts and just <laughs> having block parties, right? Um, a way of resisting um, and, and existing. And uh, also just, I'm an MC, so to, to just be able to do freestyles on a train, right, without any amplification or necessity or needing equipment, right? So just having that um, at my grasp. And I grew up listening to not so much revolutionary artists, but it was more the conditions um, and the situations and mentors that I had that kind of like guided me in a direction. Um, because if you think of hip hop, it's oversaturated right now, but in the early times you had many different viewpoints at the same time, right? You had the party, having fun guy, you had the black power, you know, and then you had the gangster rap, right? You have all these different elements in one space, in one stage. And that was what I was like listening to. Ah, man, if I were to bring out some of my raps when I was 12, 13, it'd be embarrassing, right? Um, but that's what I modeled. That's what I was looking at. That's what inspired me. Um, but it didn't turn me off to things. It wasn't until later that um, I realized that art needed to, I need to say something on stage, right? You know, if I'm like, if I have a space to say something, I have to know what I'm saying, do my research, and use it as a platform, as a tool. Um, uh, so, you know, even thinking outside the box of what is revolutionary, right? And, and, and to be an artist, a teacher, um, and how you, as an organizer, there's many organizers here, like how do you reimagine your 
organizational structure, right? Are you still doing things that you were doing 20 years ago or five years ago, right? Like, how are you challenging yourself? That's very artistic to think about ways and some kind of like new imaginative ways of how to engage other people, right? This panel is dope. You know, like, I was like, yeah, it's, I'm glad we're having this because this is something that we, we need to have more of this, right? Where artists are usually, you just go to their play and see that, or you go to a performance and hear them, but to actually have a dialogue and, and, and plan something, right? A after the fact, it's good to build. So hip hop inspired me. Um, I'm a child of hip hop. I love hip hop. And I know we could take it higher. Um, and, you know, that's what we're doing with our organizations that we are building with. Okay, very nice. Um, yeah, it's really interesting when you think about uh, what, what fuels you and what gets you involved in the social aspect with, with you. And, and like for also for me as an African American, it's like a lot of our existence has already a political thing behind it. Mm -hmm. So we can either choose to look at it or, and you know, and get involved in Housewives of Atlanta, whatever. <laughs> or, and I'm not knocking that in case anybody's watching what well, likes the show. Um, or you can, it, it can, it can bring you to such a point where you say, look, I, I want to say something about it. I want to comment on this. And, uh, and I, I think I wanted to go back, at what point, it's not on our questions, but at what point did you, I know you were saying that you, when you were with your friends and everything, and you would set up little community things. At what point was it that, that that light bulb went off and you just said, oh, you know, I can use this to empower people. I can do something I love and I can also use it to empower someone. That's just a question that I didn't give you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess for me, it's when I people actually started listening to you and um, I don't know, when I was in high school, I was just a student and like a quiet art student, but then um, for the National Art Honor Society, nobody was taking the lead on it and it was kind of fizzling out of high school, so I just took it and made the initiative and then I started talking to other people who were also interested in it. Um, so I think it's, that was when I had a turning point, was when if you just spoke out and you spoke to other people and they had the same interest as you, that you could, you know, mobilize and create something and then everyone just seemed to be interested in making community stuff happen. So, um, and that's exactly what's happening now too with Arts in Bushwick, is that we are finding more and more people from the community. Even t like every event that we go out, we, someone else wants to come and volunteer with us. Um, so our team is growing immensely because of all the projects that we're working on, but yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what the question was. But well, it was, you know, like there, there's a, at least like for me, there uh -huh. was some point where a light bulb just went off and I went, oh, and everything came together in my understanding of what I could do with my, my uh, art. Okay, I'm going to go backwards because my day job is teaching at John Jay College. And uh, so this past semester I was teaching Introduction to Theater. What is that? You know, usually the most boring course you can <laughs> possibly imagine. So, uh, so I asked the students, I said, you know, we're gonna start, we're gonna read some plays, but we're also gonna write some plays. So what do you want to write about? And we spent quite a bit of time figuring out what they wanted to write about. And the two topics that they wanted to write about were the injustice of the justice system. John Jay is called John Jay College of Criminal Justice, right? Um, but, you know, all the kids there, uh, black and brown kids mainly have been stopped and frisked. Their friends have been stopped and frisked, blah, blah, blah. So they, they knew a lot about the injustice of the justice system. And the other topic that they wanted to write about was domestic violence. And they all wrote plays uh, as well as reading plays. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, I don't know, that, that arts, teaching the arts can really release people's creativity because, of course, most what students mainly hate to do, although I made them do that too, they had to write a paper about Antigone. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, but because they had written the plays, they could write about Antigone from a criminal justice standpoint. You know, They could link Antigone to the Gitmo hunger strike. So they had a way of, of entering literature 
that meant something to them, and therefore the literature began to mean something to them. So I think that's uh, that's important. Um, I grew up, you know, hiding under my desk, waiting for the nuclear bombs to fall, um, and that seemed really stupid, you know, even at a, to a second grader, you know, that that we would be doing this and we would protect ourselves under the desk, right? Yeah, yeah, under the desk. So, and then of course there was the Vietnam War, which when I was in college, and that, uh, and I went to the University of Wisconsin, which with Berkeley and Columbia, and then I went to graduate school at Columbia, so I just followed the movement east. Um, uh, so the first time, the first anti-war march I went on, uh, there were 25 of us in the state capital at uh, Madison as the state capital, and we were all being photographed by the FBI. And the FBI they were clearly uh, present on the balcony of the Capitol building taking our photos. So that was, you know, it was all just very, very clear uh, from uh, then on <laughs> or, or before. Um, yeah. Well, you, you kind of stated yours, so, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what prompted me to ask the question. Unless you want to just go on. No, okay. All right, so we're going to go to the, because <laughs> we want to give people a chance to also ask questions and, uh, and engage in dialogue with our panelists. Okay, last and final question for $3,000. Okay, I take it. <laughs> How do you as an artist choose a political topic and then act on it? And do you take motivation from the newspaper? And are you hoping to spur other people to action? I know some of you have answered some of that in what you had asked. But uh, Spirit Child, can you start since you're the... Okay. Um, oh, from everywhere, every day, every time, right? Um, this, this moment is a song. Um, and, you know, just it's, it's, it's all the time. But uh, through movement and motion, like I was mentioning, through our political education and discussions, and reading, um, so I'm going to be working on a project for Maroon, right? Um, and uh, we did something for me as well. Um, so for people that we feel, or issues that we feel are not getting enough attention, um, I feel like that's where the creativity we at least try to channel it, um, and 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 you know make a project around it or something like that. Um, so yeah, essays, newspapers. Um, a lot of times it's the interactions with just the youth that I work with, you know, it's very inspirational um, and emotional uh, and um, or just experiences firsthand dealing with NYPD, right? Like that's just, that'll make you want to write a few albums. <laughs> you know? And there are some, but yeah, that's, that's it. Um, I mean, for me, I, as a child, I moved around a lot, so having a sense of community is extremely important to me. Um, that being said, I usually choose topics more closer to home in my own community, so I'm, I'm helping out the people in my backyard before I go off and fly to another community in need. Um, but that and also my other line of work, I work with always underrepresented communities. I work with a nonprofit hospital right now and a pre-college program at NYU for inner city students. So I've always been interested in helping underrepresented populations because it just doesn't seem fair that I was able to go to an amazing public school and students here in New York City are struggling to just pass a state exam. Um, but, I mean, that being said, um, the Arts and Bushwick community team, we're not necessarily political in nature, but it definitely comes up, especially um, when we talk about the gentrification of Bushwick because of the new influx of young artists moving into the community. It is raising the rent. Um, Arts in Bushwick also has their annual huge Bushwick Open Studios Festival, which has hundreds of artists and over 10,000 visitors come into the neighborhood. Um, but with the community team, our goals in, to the community is to have a sense of cohesion and collaboration with community members and to, again, like I said, said mesh in all the different communities that we have in Bushwick. Um, for instance, for we had a community day for Bushwick Open Studios this year. It was our first year and we collaborated with community organizations that have been servicing Bushwick community for over 30 years. Um, and we also brought in some new faces of organizations and local artists and performers that were either just moved to Bushwick or they had 
you know, we're born and raised in Bushwick. And we brought it, and all of us came together as a collaborative artwork. There's no, no way any of us could have done it by ourselves. And we had a family fun event in the heart of Bushwick. Um, so those are the things that I, that really gets me going, and I love it, and that is why I do it. And um, I think, I mean, it's inevitable, which is sad, that Bushwick is going to, you know, all the rent is going to rise, like raise, but we do have the potential to work together and create a diverse community um, and grow up with that. <coughs> okay, so uh, I think you you don't choose your topic. Your topic chooses you, and you then it, if it doesn't let you go, I, I mean, at least I'm a playwright, so the thought of writing a play is so terrifying that. that if, if the topic won't let me go and doesn't let me alone, I'll, I'll hunker down and do it, you know. So, so I, but, but as you guys were talking, I just wanted to, I thought I'd say this instead of what I thought I would say, which is, <laughs> which is the history of, of our theater the last 18 years. I'm just going to tell you briefly what we've done and how it connects, because in a certain way, I only figured it out recently. Um, the first play that we, we did some plays together before we started the theater, but I won't go into those. The first play we did as Theater 3 Collaborative was a play called The Beekeeper's Daughter. And it was written during the Bosnian War. And it was about a victim of one of the rape camps, a Bosnian woman who had been raped by in, in a camp that the Serbs ran uh, to destroy the Bosnian Muslim population. Uh, the idea was to, impre one of the ideas was to impregnate Bosnian Muslim women with Serbian babies and then, you know, they would be outcasts from their home and they would be giving birth to non-Muslim uh, babies, etc. So there were organized rape camps uh, in, in Bosnia. And uh, this was happening in 1994, 95. Um, the story was broken in Newsday. Uh, I forget the name of the reporter, but a really important um, reporter. And we were going to Italy. We had friends in Italy who used to invite us. So we were 300 miles from uh, Bosnia uh, vacationing at a castle, <laughs> literally. Um, and, but I felt I could, I almost could hear the screams uh, coming across the Adriatic. I mean, it was so close. And that juxtaposition of the, the a new genocide in Europe uh, not so long after the Second World War, um, and this kind of, uh, you know, liberal uh, 20th century lifestyle that we were leading. So the play was about uh, a human rights worker who brings a Bosnian refugee woman to her father's uh, um, island paradise, where he's a poet and he's having a, hetero a homosexual affair, and she comes with a pregnant woman who's afraid of men, and, and all hell breaks loose. Um, and, and it's really about the, the, the formation of a new kind of family because a lot of things happen and everybody gets reintegrated, uh, but in a new way, including this baby who's born, whose mom can't touch him, but the poet actually falls in love with the baby and suddenly the poet is being the father to a baby in the way that he couldn't have been to his own daughter when he was a young poet running around, <laughs> you know, ignoring his own kids. So, so that was the first, the first play that we did together, and and um, nine, um, and got to write a little article in the Times about it, and therefore the the young man who created the play got political asylum in San Francisco <laughs> because right after that there was a big crackdown on the homosexual community in in Egypt, um, uh, up until. Uh, the work we did around the Iraq War, which was first of all an outdoor ritual in the uh, graveyard at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery for the four nights of the Republican Convention when Bush was renominated for the second term. Um, we stood in the graveyard and we told stories that I'd collected from the war from all different sides, victims, uh, insurgents, so-called insurgents, um, soldiers, uh, uh, prisoners, <coughs> And we read, we read the names of the dead. At that time, the ratio was 15 Iraqis to one American. And we, we did that outside as a public ritual. And it was the first time that the Arab American artist community felt comfortable after 9-11 joining with the non-Arab American cultural comu uh, community. And so suddenly, we had a larger community. Um, and, and we had people of, of uh, you know, Muslims and non-Muslims and people of all colors 
uh, standing and doing this ritual. And then that turned into a, to a docudrama called Iraq Speaking of War, which uh, we did on the second anniversary of the Iraq War. From that came Prophecy, which is in this book, which you all must buy because no one's buying it, um, called Acts of War. It's one of our problems with doing political art. Acts of War, Iraq and Afghanistan in seven plays. And um, it's seven anti-war plays by British and American playwrights. Uh, um, my play that's in this book is a play called Prophecy. And it, it was written during uh, the 2006 invasion of Lebanon. And Najla Saeed, who is Edward Said's daughter, was in the play. She was in Lebanon uh, in being bombed. And I was in Macedonia, of all places. But we were in touch <coughs> with by email. So the story, the story is not only the story of an Iraq war vet who comes home and ends up killing himself. Um, it is also the story of the memories of Vietnam, and it is also the story of a family that puts itself back together um, around a uh, daughter who is half Jewish and half Palestinian, uh, who comes home and confronts her Jewish father, who she doesn't know, because she's been taken back to uh, Lebanon and Palestine by her mom. Mm -hmm. and, and that family gets reconfigured in a, in a, in a new way. In a, in a, and, and after that came Another Life, which is this, the play about the torture program. And, and it just felt to me I had, somebody had to write a play about the torture program. And, and I didn't know how to do it, but it, it, there was lots and lots of research that went to that. Um, the, the reason I tell this, this story is that it turns out that the, the genocide against the Bosnian Muslims in Bosnia um, by essentially the Serbs, I mean, that's sort of how it happened. Uh, um, created in the Muslim community, it happened at the same time that the Soviets were driven from Afghanistan. And it looked as though Afghanistan was be going, going to become a Muslim uh, country and a, and a place where religious Muslims could go and do community work and build schools and create a Muslim uh, nation. Um, so a lot of very political young men left Europe and went to Afghanistan because they realized that the, Bosnia, the Muslim community in Europe was under attack. And a lot of those men ended up in Guantanamo. And some of them are still there. And they were the men who were, were picked up. When, when, we went, when we began to bomb Afghanistan, um, people, people who were not Afghani citizens had to leave. And they went to Pakistan. And in Pakistan, there were bounty hunters who had been given, literally, the CIA just sent suitcases full of money and said to people, you know, find us jihadis and bring them to us. And that's how a lot of the young men ended up in Guantanamo. Um, and as you know, there's a hunger strike in Guantanamo. 86 of the prisoners in Guantanamo, 100 and, and I forget how many are there, 130, something like that. 86 of them have been cleared for release by our government as being guilt, not guilty of any crime whatsoever. Innocent people who were picked up in this bounty hunting. Um, many of them from, uh, from Algeria, from, there's still one British citizen who's in uh, Guantanamo. Um, so there's much more I could say about that, but I don't want to go on forever. But, but I'm just trying to sort of draw the picture of how, you know, how things evolved in, in our work uh, together. And, and then just one other thing, which is that uh, the new play is called Extreme Weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R, and it's about climate change and climate change denial. And, and oddly enough, having written the play about torture and, and learning how the lies that were gotten <coughs> under torture were used to start the Iraq War, um, uh, and then learning how uh, the fossil fuel industry has spent millions of dollars uh, to convince the American Congress, not so much the American people, but certainly the American Congress, that there is no such thing as global warming. At the same time as we see, you know, uh, extreme weather. Uh, so there's there is a there is a continuum to our work. Beautiful. Uh, okay. Um, before um, to if what advice would you give to a young person or anybody in this room who has artistic ability, and we all have artistic ability, we all create our lives every single day. 
So when we get up, we brush our teeth, we, we create our lives, we create what we want to have in our lives. So that makes us artists. But those who want to be extreme artists, <laughs> which means that they want to paint or dance or write or whatever, what advice would you give to someone who says, I want to be able to, you said something really brilliant, like it calls to you. Uh, instead of you looking for it, it, it actually comes to you. What advice uh, would you give someone who is interested in doing this or including uh, activism a in their art? And inside that, just a little closing statement. Uh, anybody want to flip a coin and who <laughs> wants to start? <laughs> anybody just... Uh... I can go first again, <laughs> since I went first first. Um, I would say, you know, for anyone that was interested in like really honing in and getting a calling from something to want to build something, you need to first know who you are. Um, and, and that you have to give yourself a lot of alone time or just some self-exploration, um, which a lot of artists do in general is explore and they explore their surroundings and where they are. Um, and then of course, always share that with someone else and share that with as many people as you can and get feedback from them and usually it's really great feedback and which gives you more confidence and also a chance to collaborate and work with someone else to help get a message out if that is your goal. Um, so that's my advice for anybody. You guys? I don't care. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my advice would be uh, go in, um, like really in and do the impossible, right? Like, um, if you're a painter, like, go beyond the canvas. If you're an MC, go beyond 4-4 four, four timing, this Western, right, like, idea of how to create stuff. Do odd meter timing, do odd things, do crazy things, love it, love your life, live your life, um, and uh, share in the process, right? Like, continue to share every day. Um, and uh, be fearless, you know, um, and uh, passionate. I think, you know, like you were mentioning, all of us are artists. It's whether we want to tap into that or not. Um, but if you are an artist already and you're doing stuff, uh, reinvent yourself, right? Don't do what you did yesterday, you know. Um, challenge yourself. Um, I just did a bar mitzvah like an hour ago. It was crazy. It was crazy. We were doing a, a, it was a saxophonist and a koto player, right? This is Japanese instrument. So we're sitting around in this room, um, which Susan was there, by the way. It was crazy. I was like seeing people. I was like, oh, wow. All right, cool. It's, organ it's like revolutionary bar mitzvah, right? And, and I'm doing this rap in 13, right? So like, it's like all odd and People try to find a beat, and it's not even really a beat. You know, it's kind of off intentionally. So we were like, I don't know if this is hip or not. Nah, nah, it's just really off. Um, but, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have done that uh, 16, right? Like, I wouldn't have done that. And I, I try to do things all the time, something new. Um, somebody invites me, I'm there. Sweet 16, on it. <laughs> Whatever, right? So that's my advice. That's good advice, both of you. <laughs> both of you had very good advice. I have not, you know, very little to add to that except uh, I, I think that one should know the history of their art form. So if it's theater, you should know plays, you should read plays, classic plays especially. Um, so I think there's, a, you know, there's the, the, the learning from the past. And then I always tell people, find the people whose work you love and go there. And apprentice when you're young, apprentice yourself there. You won't do what they do. In fact, if you become an artist, you'll end up rebelling against your best teachers. <laughs> but you'll learn a hell of a lot from them while you're working with them. Um, I think people have to go on love. You have to go where you love and love what you do. And then you will keep reinventing. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's give a hand to our I like that. I like that very much. That was really, really inspiring.